Hi friends, Rabbi Reiner back with you again and very excited to be pondering uh, Romans chapter 1 verses 8 through 17 with you this evening. Great passage. Uh, probably more here than at first you would think. Um, it takes some thinking about this passage. And uh, one of the things that, that I'm probably going to do this evening is to um, ask a lot of questions that came out of my pondering. Appl application questions that I think um, are just really pertinent to the passage and that as I pondered the passage, as I tried to dig a little bit deeper, um, they were just questions that I began to ask myself. So I'm going to ask you the same questions. And so as we ponder uh, this passage together, um, I'll ask a lot of questions. In some cases, I may try to give a few comments and answers to the questions, but in a lot of cases, I'm just going to let the questions stand by themselves. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get rolling. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you that you uh, provoke um, our souls with questions as we read, and ask that you would do that uh, this evening as we ponder this passage together. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start right at the beginning. I'll read like a verse at a time. I've got at least one question for every verse. Um, in some cases, I've got two questions. And you'll see as we go through this um, kind of how I ponder this passage. I turn uh, the different verses into questions. Um, and in, in a lot of cases, they're just personal application questions that are coming out of the text. So verse 8, uh, Paul says, First of all, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. All right, so question number one that I ask is this. On a scale of one to ten, how satisfied are you with your prayer life? Paul is going to spend a couple of verses talking about prayer. Um, and, and I realized as I was uh, reading this passage that my prayer life is nowhere near like what Paul's is. So question number one, how satisfied are you with your prayer life? Do you express thanks for the people that you care about, much like Paul does right here? Is that a part of your praying for other people and just saying, Father, thank you so much for my friend or for my family or whatever? And then the second question that comes out of this is, is this, is your faith being reported all over the world as apparently is the Romans' faith? Um, is it even being reported around Durham? Is it being reported around your neighborhood? Is it even being reported around the church? Do people talk about your faith even around our church? If the answer is no to any of those questions, why not? Why is our faith not being reported? So here's what I think was going on. So church in Rome. Uh, Rome was kind of the center of civilization and the center of the world. And a lot of folks from, say, Jerusalem, from Corinth, from Ephesus, from Philippi, uh, from Thessalonica, from all of these other places that, that Paul has been um, visiting, uh, he runs into folks who have been to Rome. And these folks are talking about the faith of of everybody in Rome. And so it, it's, it's not like um, there's bold headlines in the newspaper that talks about Roman saints have great faith. No, it's just individual reports coming back to Paul in the city that he is visiting that where people are talking about in the midst of the persecution, um, in the midst of everything that is going on in Rome, that people are talking about their faith. And so um, it took a lot to believe and to stay strong in Rome at this time. And so people were impressed by the faith that these saints had. Are people likewise being impressed by our faith? Are they talking about our faith? Are, are other people hearing about 
our faith outside the walls of our church. All right, verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you. For God is my witness, whom I serve. All right, so the question that I, that, that, that I had for this verse is this. Is serving God of highest priority to you? the way it was to Paul, is that your desire, is to serve God, um, and is that of highest priority? The other question is, if, if God is not the one that you're serving, who are you serving? Who are you serving? So you guys may remember back in the 60s, maybe back in the 70s, the 80s, even 90s and early 2000s, there was a songwriter by the name of Bob Dylan, a prolific songwriter. I think I read that he has recorded like 70 some odd albums. Um, he was kind of a voice of a generation back in my day, even before my day. Uh, he was born into a Jewish family. At some point when he was a young man, he converted to Christianity. Now there's been a lot of talk over the years as to whether Bob Dylan would still be considered a Christian, but of the reports that I'm reading, uh, seem to indicate yes. Um, but he wrote a song way back, probably in the 80s, uh, that said, uh, that talked about, you got to serve somebody. You got to serve somebody. And here's a couple of lines from the song. He says, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. So the question as we ponder this verse of scripture is, who are you serving? Are you serving the Lord? Or are you a slave to sin? Are you a slave to self and your selfishness? Are you a slave to Satan? Or indeed, are you a slave and a servant to your Savior? You gotta serve somebody. Now, the other question that comes out of this passage is where Paul says that without ceasing, I mention you always in my prayers. How do you pray without ceasing? You know, there's a verse over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. If you need a scripture verse to memorize, this is a great one. It's three words, pray without ceasing. It's the whole verse, pray without ceasing. So, you know, when our thoughts turn to worry, when our thoughts turn to fear or, or disappointment or anger, then we need to get in the habit of consciously and quickly turning every thought into prayer and every prayer into thanksgiving. For Christians, prayer should be like breathing, and it ought to be natural, uh, but it takes practice for prayer to feel as natural as breathing does. It just doesn't come natural, but it can, with practice, begin to be natural. I'll give you an example. When I was a junior in high school, I um, broke the, the little finger of my right hand. This was my writing hand. Now, this was during the school year. I could not write with my right hand. I couldn't do anything with my right hand because it was in a cast. So, number one, I had to learn to write with my left hand. I had to learn how to brush my teeth with my left hand. And believe it or not, here I am almost 50 years later, and I am still brushing my teeth with my left hand, even though I've got full use of my right hand. Brushing my teeth because of a lot of practice began to feel very natural uh, using my left hand. So the more you do it, the more it starts to feel natural. So we need to train ourselves to pray without ceasing. We need to turn every thought um, every worry, every fear, every disappointment into prayer. And little by little, prayer without ceasing will start to become more natural. There's people in the scripture uh, that prayer just came naturally to, uh, probably because of a lot of practice. Do you, do you know who Old Camel Knees was? Old Camel Knees was James, the brother of Jesus. 
He spent a lot of time in prayer to the point where he began to be called Old Camel Knees because he spent so much time on his knees. Daniel is reputed to be a man who spent a lot of time praying. It, it began to be natural to him. I think Paul was also a guy that, that like he says, pray without ceasing. Pa prayer came natural to him. And you read throughout his uh, letters about how he was praying for the saints in the different cities that he had visited. So question is, um, are you anywhere near the point of praying without ceasing? All right, verse 10. Verse 10, he says, um, that without ceasing I mention you, verse 10, always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. So here's the question that I came up with. First and foremost, Paul wanted to do God's will. Paul wanted to do God's will. Um, how do you determine God's will? And how can you tell the difference between pursuing your hopes and dreams and desires and pursuing God's agenda? Well, there's a great verse of scripture later on in the book of Romans that I think helps to address that. We'll talk about it and we'll ponder it later, but I'm going to read it for you right now. It says this, I appeal to, this is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, get this, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do you determine what God's will is? You offer yourself to God. Holy and acceptable to God as an act of worship. And you don't do that just one time. You do that every single day. You offer yourself to God. And when you are, are offered up to God, then he will direct your steps. He will reveal his will to you. He will lead you along the way. Okay, verse 11. Verse 11 says, for I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. All right, question. Do you approach relationships with a similar intent as Paul, looking for a way to strengthen and build up and encourage and challenge others? Is that the way that you approach the, the lunch meeting that you have, uh, the time that you have with friends to strengthen and encourage their faith. We need to get into the habit of, of approaching all of our relationships, especially our, our believers, believing relationships, with the idea that we are going to strengthen and encourage our brothers and our sisters in Christ whenever we are with them. How do you do this? Well, I think two ways uh, that I'll just mention real quickly. It's by what you tell others, and secondly, by what questions you ask of others. For instance, what you tell others in the midst of just a conversation over lunch. You know, we typically talk about sports, we talk about the weather, we talk about family, we talk about, you know, lots of other things but scripture. So why not, as a part of the conversation, say, hey, Listen, I was reading this great verse in the book of Romans this week. Uh, listen to what it said. Tell me what you think about it. So, you know, you introduce the subject of Scripture and you have a conversation about Scripture. Secondly, um, it's by what questions that you ask others, because often we're asking them questions about, you know, their family and about all kinds of things. Often we don't even broach the subject of faith. But what about what about this question uh, that you could have a conversation with? Hey, tell me, how has the Lord been nourishing you lately? What, what scripture have you been reading? How have you seen God working in your life? And just strengthen and build others up um, through not only what you tell them, but by the questions that you ask. All right, verse 12. Verse 12, that is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. So question, you know, who are the people in your life that you are being 
strengthened and encouraged by? Who are the people that are building you up when you are in their presence? And then conversely, who are the people that drain you spiritually? A couple of great questions to think about when you think about mutual encouragement that Paul is talking about right here. So here's my encouragement. Be really, really careful about how much time you spend around drainers, those who would drain faith out of you. Um, I've got a college student friend right now who has recently made a decision not to spend time around someone that they have considered to be a good friend for a long time just because they were being drained spiritually. That's a hard decision to make because of a long-standing friendship, but they realized that they were not being lifted up. They were not being strengthened in their faith by spending time with this friend. So they are being really careful about how much time they spend together. Okay, verse 13. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. So Paul has, has wanted to come to Rome, but he's been prevented from doing so. So here's the question that I came up with. You know, no doubt Paul is disappointed that he hadn't been able to get to Rome to this point. So how do you handle disappointment? What do you do when your hopes and dreams and plans for the future go sideways? When they don't happen, when life doesn't happen the way that you want it to? So I'm going to mention a couple of cliched answers, but they're really, really true. Number one, when you are dealing with disappointment, trust God's sovereignty. Trust that even in the midst of disappointment, God is in control. Easier said than done, I understand. But one thing that'll help is this, cling to his promises Read the Word of God. Cling to the Word of God. Cling to a verse like Romans chapter 8, 28, for we know that all things work together for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purposes. Cling to the promises of God and then intentionally decide that you are going to live by faith and not by sight, that you are going to continue to walk by faith even when days are dark, that you are going to continue to pray with thanksgiving even though things are not going the way that you want them to. You are going to continue to keep seeking after God even when it seems like God has, has let you down. You're going to keep serving God. You keep keeping on. And that's a great way to handle disappointment or when life goes sideways. Okay, verse 14. This will be quick. Paul says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So here's my question. Do you see people as God and as Paul saw people? Or do you fight the sin of favoritism? Do you fight the sin of of racism. Paul was under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. Barbarians are really just non-Greeks. Anybody who was not Greek, anybody who wasn't like Paul, he was under obligation to Greeks and to non-Greeks, to, to the wise and to the foolish. He saw people the same way, as, as needy and as dead in their sin and of needing God. You know, do we look at all peoples in that same way? All right, verse 15. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So here's the question. Is there an eagerness to use my spiritual gifts, to use your spiritual gifts for the glory of God? Or is there merely a sense of spiritual duty? And how can you go from just being dutiful to being eager to use your spiritual gifts 
for the glory of God. And then secondly, why was there a need to preach the gospel to the saints in Rome? He says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Why was he eager to preach the gospel to the saints are in Rome? Well, it's because believers need the gospel too. We need to be reminded that we were once sinners and we were far, far, far away from God. We need to be reminded often that because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we were reconciled to the Father. We need to be reminded that it was because of Christ's sacrifice that we have life. We need to be reminded of what Jesus did for us. That's the gospel. And we need to be reminded of that because we forget that. And when we forget, we're not thankful and we become selfish and we do not treat other people the way that Christ would want us to treat them. We need to be reminded of the gospel. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Question, is there any sense in which you are ashamed of the gospel? Where bold, and, and, and then the question is, where is boldness being demonstrated in your life? Where is boldness being demonstrated in your life? Have you personally experienced the power of God in your life? Where are you experiencing the power of God in your life? If you are a believer, you have experienced the power of God in your life. You were once dead, and now you are alive. God made you alive, and that was because of the power of the resurrection. So now, where is that boldness? Where is that power being demonstrated in your life? Verse 17, he says, For in it... In the gospel, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, last question. Do you thoroughly understand the gospel and what it means for you as a believer? Do you day in and day out live by faith? The righteous shall live by faith. And what would this look like if you did? Let me close with this verse of scripture over in Philippians chapter 3 because Paul kind of addresses this. He says, Whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The righteous shall live by faith. And it's not our righteousness, it's the righteousness of of Christ. And it was Paul's desire to be found in him, not having a righteousness of his own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So, understanding the gospel is key to living by faith. All right, so this passage is a little bit different. I'm asking a lot of application questions. I find that asking the right questions is a great start to finding the right answers. And not only is God's word a great place to find answers, but it's also a great place to go to find questions. So now, the real work of pondering begins as we try to answer the questions that this text provokes. So, may God provoke your thinking in ways that disturb and disrupt your spiritual status quo as he has done for me. And in the process, may he draw you closer to God's resplendent throne of grace. So until next week, this is Rabbi Reiner out saying, Shalom, y'all. <laughs>